I'm going to start out with a little story. There were some Americans who were stationed in Korea during the Korean War, and they rented a home, and they hired a local boy to cook and clean for them. These Americans were a bunch of jokesters, and they soon began to take advantage of the young boy's nativity. They'd smear Vaseline on the stove handle so that when he turned the stove on in the morning, he'd get grease all over his fingers. They'd put little water buckets over the door so that he'd get deluged when he opened the door. They even nailed his shoes to the floor during the night. Day after endless day, the little fellow took the brunt of their practical jokes without saying anything. No blame, no self-pity, no temper tantrums. Finally, the men felt guilty about what they were doing. So they sat down with the young friend and they said, you know, look, we know these pranks aren't funny anymore. and We're sorry. We're never going to take advantage of you again. It seemed a bit too good to be true to the houseboy. No more sticky on the stove, he asked. Nope. No more water on door. Nope. No more nail shoes to the floor. Nope, never again. Okay, the boy said with a smile. No more spit and soup. <laughs> Now, when I was uh, in high school, I was in a band, and my freshman year, we went to a band camp. And during that camp, since I was a freshman, and it just so happens I was the only boy freshman in the band that year, and they decided they were going to haze as freshmen. Now, there were several girls, and we actually went to Appalachia State University for band camp, and we stayed in the dorm, first time ever in the dorm. And the girls were on the floor above us, and they had a common area right off the elevator that you could go up and get off of, and we were allowed to hang out together and things. And so during this time, I witnessed some of the hazing that the girls were going through, and it was pretty rough. I mean, they had them going down the hallways with toothbrushes trying to clean the floors. Uh, they had them go over, when we went to the cafeteria, they had them go over and they had to sit down on the lap of what the football players who were there for practice and sing to them. And, you know, these are ninth grade girls here. Most of them are very shy, but they were being forced to do these things. It was hazy. Well, in my case, since I was the only boy, I was roomed with a junior in the dorm. And their plans didn't quite go as well as they had hoped because, as you all know me, I don't really respond to things like that real well. So they were determined that they were going to haze me. And so I knew about some of the hazing. So I come back one day and I walked up to the dorm room and I looked at the door handle and it's kind of glistening. So I looked and sure enough, Vaseline all over the door handle. I went down to the bathroom, got me a paper towel, cleaned off the door and I went in. I was constantly doing things like that that really frustrated me. So one day I come back and well actually it was night, it was time, it was time into bed and as we climbed into bed, I felt something. And I realized they had dumped salt all over my bed. Well, I just, it was, I mean, just the bank was only about that big. It was kind of raised up off the floor and your drawers and stuff, your clothes were under. So I just kind of rolled over, took the mattress, and flipped it over the floor. And I slept on the hardwood. I camped down on the ground before, didn't really bother me. <clears throat> well, my roommate hadn't got in yet. So he came in trying to figure out why my mattress was in the floor, complained a little bit about that, climbed up in his bed, and discovered that they had done the same thing to his bed because, you see, they didn't know which one was mine. <laughs> he complained most of the night because they had gotten his bed along with mine and me. I just tossed over the floor. So that's kind of how I reacted to things. The reason I tell you these stories is because what we'll talk about today is perspective. Now, you can look at the story of the Korean boy and you can say, those mean, abusive American men. How dare they treat such a young boy that way, take advantage of him, and abuse him with all their practical jokes. I'm sure you've heard news stories about the hazings of going in college and how people are like, it's horrible what they put people through. It's terrible what they do to them. And you can have that kind of perspective. And there would be some legitimacy to it because you can say, well, people have been hurt doing hazings. People have actually died because of the hazing, because it's gone too far. Were they being abusive to the Korean boy? There's another perspective, though, that you can look at and say, these men cared about that boy. Because here they were, it's, it's, they were pranksters. They had pulled pranks on themselves against each other. 
So they were showing him the same kind of respect and love that they had for one another by including them in their jokes. Yes, he was the brother of their jokes, but probably because he was an easy mark because they all knew each other. Just like I knew what was coming in the hazing I had, and I foiled a lot of it. They knew each other, so they knew the practical jokes that we pulled. So it was kind of, they kind of defeated him. So they found a new victim. But if they didn't care for him or they had no respect for him or didn't think anything of him, that he was just a dog, they wouldn't have bothered. So you can have a different perspective. I can have taken the perspective that how dare those boys pick on me. Here I am, a freshman, away from home at a college I've never been to before, and here they are picking on me, making me feel belittled, trying to abuse me. They tried to get me to go see the cafeteria workers. I wasn't having them. <laughs> But I could have been offended by that. I could have went and I could have reported them and said they are pressuring me to doing things I don't want to do. And I'm sure somebody in authority would have probably said, oh, leave him alone, don't bother him. Especially in today's society. Back then, probably they'd have been more like, come on, grow up. But you can have a different perspective. The, the facts haven't changed. The facts are exactly the same, but you can have a different perspective on those facts and how you approach them. And what your perspective is will affect your attitude on things. A person's perspective of situation plays an important part in how a person handles that situation. You see, in my case, I thought it was fun to foil their attempts. As much as they were trying to do things to me, I was enjoying figuring out how to stop it and listen to them complain because it hadn't worked or listening to the guy I was rooming with because he was getting hazed along with me and it was affecting him more than it was me because I would hear him in the hallways, come on guys, it's not, not me, I'm a junior, it's not fair. And I thought it was hilarious. But I could have gotten angry. And I could have went around and I could have been an angry person to everyone there. What do you think those people would have thought of me? How do you think they would have responded? Not well. I sure wouldn't have made friends. You would have gotten worse. <laughs> well, that's a possibility too. They were trying. So how you approach problems and how you approach things affects our attitude about things and it affects how we interact with other people. When people are faced with a situation, some people look at it and they look at it as a hurdle. They look at it as something that they have to try to get over. They look at it like, I can't overcome that. I can't get over that. That's in my way. That's blocking me. I can't do something. And there's some people who look at a situation and they go, hmm, now that's a challenge. But I can get by it. I can get around it. I can get over it. I can go under it. They think of ways to handle the situation. It's not something that stops them. It's something that encourages them to move forward. When you look at a situation, if you take a situation and you look at it as a problem you can't get over, it will stop you dead. But it doesn't go away. It stays there. <coughs> so what kind of perspective should we have and is it possible to change our perspective on things? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. So I'll just read it as one verse. You can write it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 says, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. The contemporary English version states, As we came to Macedonia, we didn't have any chance to rest. We were faced with all kinds of problems. We were troubled by enemies and troubled by fears. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you just look around and it's like there's just always something going on in your life? There's always problems or something that seems to be getting in your way that you have to try and overcome? Well, you know, if you haven't figured it out, problems are part of life. If you're living, you have problems. There's no way around them. They occur. You see, we're living in a world that has human beings in it. And not every human being has the same perspective. Not the same human being has the same beliefs. 
And so just on those things, you can run into problems and issues. And they will cause you problems. But how do you respond to a problem? How does God expect us to respond to problems? What is it God expects out of His people when they encounter a trial or tribulation? Some people will get a chip on their shoulder. And they will get upset and they'll be like, well, you don't understand where I'm coming from because life's been unfair to me. My whole life has been rough. You just don't understand. And so they will use that and they will end up stagnating because they believe they're justified. I would call it the victim mentality. Because they believe that everything that has happened has happened against them. And you or somebody else can't possibly understand what they're going through. Some people feel like they're facing difficulties that are really completely out of their control. I have no control over that. That's causing me an issue, and I have no control over it. I can't control how that person reacts to me. I can't control what the company is doing, whether they're saying they're going to lay off or have not have layoffs, whether they're hiring or not hiring, whether they're giving raises. I have no control over that. And it's caused me problems. But I can't do anything about it because I have no control. Some people have to deal with life-threatening diseases. Some people go to the doctor and they get diagnosed and you hear that diagnosis of, I'm sorry, you have cancer. Or I'm sorry, you have some other disease. We don't have a cure. It looks like that your illness is terminal. What control do they have over that? What control over the, do they have of whether they get cancer or not or whether they get a deadly disease or not? What control do you have over that? How can you possibly have control over that? How do you possibly overcome something like that? People will blame God. Because they have no control. They have no control that they got some kind of disease, so it must be God's fault because it's somebody's fault. And they will try to find whose fault it is. Maybe a spouse walks out. Maybe you're facing marital problems. And they just walk out. It's not my fault. I did everything I could so that they would say, but yet they still walked out. How is that my fault? How do I have any control over that? I couldn't stop them. I did everything to keep them here, but they left. What control do I have over that? But yet there it is. There's the problem. I have nothing I can do about it because I have no control. I don't know what it is, but all of us in our lives have challenges. We have small challenges and we have large challenges that we have to address, we have to take on. Paul certainly was one man who did do of adversities and hardships. We're told many things that Paul experienced in his life serving God. Do you think Satan was watching Paul and trying to trip him up? Do you think that Satan had any interest in Paul and what he was doing? And was looking for the times and abilities to be able to trip Paul up to stop him? Do you not think that in your lives Satan looks for opportunities to trip you up and to stop you? That in any way that he can get you out of God's church? Do you think Satan is happy that you're here today? That you're worshiping God? That you recognize this as the Sabbath and haven't been deceived by all the work that Satan did to deceive the millions of people in the world? <coughs> That Sunday is the true day of the church? Do you think Satan is happy with this? Do you think he's not looking for the chance to trip you up or cause you problems that will make you turn your back on God's truth? I would love to be able to stand up here and tell you God loves you and you will have no problems in life. But I would be lying to you if I did that. <laughs> Because Scripture tells us something different. John chapter 16. John chapter 16 beginning in verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe 
Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Christ says here, you're going to have trials and tribulations. You're going to have problems. You're going to have things that are thrown in front of you to cause you to stumble. You're going to have walls that go up. How do you react? What is your perspective on problems? What does Christ say here? I told you these things so that you may have peace. Be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Christ overcame the obstacles in his life. Do you think he didn't have any? Christ was human. He came to this earth as human. He faced the same kind of trials and tribulations that we face each and every day. No, he doesn't have to worry about his computer crashing. But he still had the same kind of stresses and problems that we face. The things that cause us issues, Christ had to deal with in his time in his time frame, in his culture. And he overcame. Why is the scripture here? Because he's telling us that no matter what you face, you can overcome it. Because he did. And if Christ did it, we're told we can do it. And we're even told we're going to do more than what Christ did. How is that possible if we cannot overcome the obstacles that are placed in front of us? You can let your problems overcome you, or you can overcome your problems. That's the two choices you have. You can either overcome your problems, or you can let your problems overcome you. I can tell you what will happen if your problems overcome you. You will shut down. You will stop. You will stagnate. But if you overcome your problems, then you will grow. And when you grow, you have more strength that you can face problems and that you can overcome. And as you grow and as you continue on, problems will become easier and easier to overcome. I don't care what they are. Some people say, Kelly, you don't understand. You've never had cancer. No, I haven't. You never had a deadly disease? No, I haven't. You've never been in pain every day of your life? No, I haven't. You've never had to face this kind of co-worker that I face? Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. But I can tell you one thing with complete certainty. It doesn't matter what the problem is. I don't care where it comes from, what it consists of, what it's about, you have the ability to overcome it because Christ said He overcame. And if He could, we can. So it doesn't matter what the problem is. It doesn't matter if you have cancer, if you're about to die, if this is your last day on earth, then enjoy it. Because what's going to happen? Maybe you die. What's wrong with dying? I'm not saying I want to. Don't expect any of you want to. But what is wrong with dying? What happens when you die? We wait for Christ's return. And where are we at when we return? When He returns? We are in God's kingdom. Is that such a bad thing? Is that a bad outcome? No. So then, why can we not overcome the problem of death? No. We can't overcome not dying. But we don't have to let it stop us. We don't have to sit back and go, Oh, I'm dying. Life is over. Why me? It's not fair. What did I do? I've done everything. I've kept the holidays. i kept the Sabbath. i kept the clean and i kept everything. And God gives me this disease I don't understand. That's not the proper perspective. That's a worldly perspective. Why did you get cancer? Why did you get a deadly disease? I can't tell you. I don't know. 
Could it be the water you drink? Possibly. Could it be the food you eat? Possibly. Depends on what study you read. Everything causes cancer nowadays. And so what are any of us wake up in the morning? But yet we do. So can I tell you and say why or how come? No, I can't. But I can tell you it doesn't matter. You can overcome it. It doesn't have to stop you. It depends on your perspective of it. Is it a problem or is it just a speed bump? Your perspective makes it which it is. One thing that is for certain, problems never leave us the same. When you have a problem, either you will retreat from it or you will overcome it and move forward. And when you overcome and move forward, you grow in strength. That's what trials and tribulations are. They help us to grow. They help us to grow spiritually because we respond the way we're supposed to if we're doing the right thing. When God lets something get in our way, He's not wanting to trip us up. He's not sitting there going, watch this. And then laughing if you fall on your face. He's there wanting to pick you up and hug you and hold you. But He knows that He has to let you fail so that you can improve to be better. So a problem is a chance to grow. Not such a bad thing, is it? Depends on how you want to look at it. It doesn't matter what the size of the problem is. That's not what's important. What's important is your perspective of the size of the problem. With the right perspective, the problems we face in life are indeed solvable. The wrong perspective is that problems we're facing are just too big, too difficult, and they're unsolvable. You say, Kelly, my marriage is gone. It's too far gone. There's too much water under the bridge. We can't be, ever love each other again. We're headed for divorce. It's the wrong perspective. You can always stop something. Now, in a marriage, you have two people. Two people have to want to save it. If one wants to save it, it doesn't matter how much they want to save it. The other one has to. Because you see, marriage is a partnership. We're supposed to become one. If you're two individuals going in two different directions, you cannot keep it going. You can prolong it. But if the other person is not wanting to do what they're supposed to do, if they're wanting to turn their back on the marriage, if they're wanting to walk away from their spouse, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. <clears throat> if you've done everything that you can do, if you have tried to fix everything that you possibly can fix, they have to work on it too. If you're the only one working, there is nothing you can do about it. So you're telling me I can't overcome it. Sure you can overcome it. If they walk away from marriage and they leave you, then they have made that choice. That's their choice. That's not yours. No, it's not pleasant. It'll hurt. And it can take some time. But you can't let it stop you. You have to move on and move forward and find happiness. God does not want you to be miserable. Maybe there's a reason that spouse walked off. I don't have those answers. All situations are different, but I can tell you, you can't overcome even that. You don't understand, Kelly. I am so deep in debt, I can't even see the bottom. I guess I just make God mad sometimes. He's never going to help me out with this. Wrong perspective. God is always willing to help us out of any situation if we are willing to follow Him. You see, that's the key. Some of us want to win the lottery and never buy a ticket. Heard that joke. Some of us wait for God to save us, but we don't do anything to help. It's like the joke about the guy that drowns because he's up on his house waiting for God to send somebody to help him. And all these people show up and go, no, God's going to take care of this. And he drowns. And he says, hey. God says, what did you want? I sent you a helicopter, boat. But sometimes we're not looking for what God's doing for us. We're looking for what we want. And sometimes what we want is not the best for us. Do you trust God? I don't believe anybody's going to shake their head now. At least not this here. That's why you're here. So if you trust God, then do you not trust His Word when He says He will take care of you, that He will help you? Because if you trust Him, then what problem is out there? We say today, count your many blessings. Start counting them. 
You'll get tired before you can count them all. God takes care of His people, just like I talked about last week. God will protect His people. God takes care of His people. We are His children. He doesn't want to see us suffer. Most times it's our own doing. And we have to realize that. And we have to look for the answers through God and not through our own selves. Psalms chapter 34. Psalms chapter 34. Beginning of verse 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart, and saveth such as to be a country. Save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Now tell me you have a problem that you can't overcome. And I will tell you, you just called God a liar. Because that's what he says right here. Many are the afflictions, and afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Not part of them, not some of them, all. God will help you if you let Him. If you do your part and do what you're supposed to do, then God will take care of everything else. He will make your problems become null and void. They will disappear. I have heard stories of people who have had a co-worker who was causing them problems, who was causing them grief, and the person was like, I'm either going to have to quit or they're going to fire, fire me one way or the other because this is not good. And they finally pray about it. After all this is going on, they finally pray about it. And all of a sudden, they go into door to find out the man has been promoted, he's been fired, or he's been transferred to another office. And the problem's gone. Well, that's just coincidence. Well, if you want to call it that, I call it God intervening and taking care of His people. But the person that was telling me about this went through and suffered for a long time before they prayed about it. You see, we do it to ourselves. God's not going to jump in before we ask. You have to ask. You have to say, God, help me here. I'm to a point that there's nothing else I can do. I have done everything that I feel I can do. Show me what else to do. Help me. Take care of this problem. And God will. That's what He tells us. The right perspective of the problems we face in life is to maintain an attitude that says, I don't care what I face in life. I know no matter how hopeless or no matter how impossible it may seem, I have a God that is well able to see me through. God is the great I Am. He has everything that we need. And He loves you. Is that not true? Is that not your understanding of the Scripture and the way we read it? You have got to develop an unshakable confidence in God. You have got to be fully convinced that there is nothing too hard for God to handle and that He is personally concerned about every one of us. He knows our needs before we even ask it. He knows the number of the hairs on our heads. He knows our words before we speak them. This is our Heavenly Father. And He loves you. Is there anything that you can face in this life that you can't overcome? I hope that you say at this point, no, there is not. Because you see, you can change your perspective. No matter how much of a defeatist you've been in your past, no matter how many times you've said, oh, I can't do that, I can't overcome that. Today you should know and understand through Scripture that God has said there is nothing that He can't do and He will do it for you. So that means there is nothing you can't overcome. That's God's promise to you. Do you believe it? Because He's made that promise. And you've said if you trust God, you have to trust His Word. Will it be all roses? No. Will there be trials and tribulations? Yes. Can you overcome without a doubt? You need to get to that position in your life. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Beginning of verse 1. 
My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Psalms chapter 37 verse 23 and 24. Psalms chapter 37 verse 23 and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. My challenge to you is to keep the right perspective on your problems. Always remember that no matter what you're facing, God is with you and you can overcome it and you can outlast them. It may not be pleasant. There may be some sorrow. There may be some pain. But it is nothing that will stop you because God is with you. One last illustration. I was visiting with my wife down in Texas, her brother, and we were down in San Antonio. And he said, I'll take you out and show you the mountains. Cool. Because I'd already been fascinated by the telephone poles. I've got pictures to prove it. I just <laughs> telephone poles. So I was anxious to see the mountains. <clears throat> so we went out. We're driving through this countryside. All of a sudden he says, so what do you think? I said, about what? He said, the mountains. I said, are we there? He said, yes. And he points to what I would call a hill. I said, that ain't no mountain. <laughs> come back to where I live, I'll show you mountains. Because we got some mountains around here. What that is, we call a hill. But to his perspective, that was a mountain. To my perspective, what we have around here are mountains. But guess what? If you take these mountains and you put them over around the Himalayas and the Everest, these are hills. It's about your perspective. And you can change it. And I'm telling you today that the perspective that God wants His people to have is one of hope, joy and peace because we have a heavenly father that loves us watches over us and as long as we're doing what we're supposed to be doing he will over help us overcome any problems that we ever face